So it's, I feel really amazing being back in Rome because that was my master studentship when I uh, visited Giorgio here some time ago already. <laughs> so I want to be telling you about uh, analysis of gradient-based algorithms. And it's a work that I'm presenting, but it's really all done by uh, my student, Stefano Sarao, who is in the audience, so maybe he should be presenting it, in collaboration with uh, people that are also all in the audience, except Florent, who is at home with the kids. Anyway, so first, motivation about why am I interested in gradient-based algorithms. So to motivate that, I will take a detour through this very you know, funny problem of recognizing which photo has a cat and which has a dog on it. So for us humans, this is a very easy task. And it's the task of you know, learning the rule. The, the, the task will be, I give you a database, you stare at it, and then I give you some pictures that were not in the database and you should classify, was this a dog, was it a cat? So for humans, this is easy. What about for computers? A computer sees a picture of a dog or a cat as this long series of zero ones that represent the pixelization of the figure. And this task that I describe, co describe corresponds to finding a function fw, where w would be some parameters of this function, in which if we plug this long sequence of zero ones, it outputs, say, plus one for a cat and minus one for a dog. So, Thinking about it like that, it doesn't you know, seem a very simple problem. How should we come up with this function fw? Where should we even start? And I want to stress here that kind of the notion of how good we are doing is this notion of generalization error. That is that if I give you a set of pictures that was not in the set on which the computer learned this function fw, then on that new previously unseen set of figures, pictures, the classification, is it a dog or is it a uh, cat, should be correct. So that's the fraction of the errors would be the generalization error. So this will come up later. So only something like 15 years ago, or let's say 15 years ago, we had basically no good system that would be able to do it except, you know, human just staring at the picture. These days we do, and you know about it, with deep neural networks, we can solve problems like that very routinely with very, very good performance. So now I want to tell you how this works. You know, this is what it does algorithmically. It's actually very simple. Deep neural networks is simply a pres prescription for the parametrization of this function fw. So if you know, and I suppose all of you know about linear regression that corresponds simply to this function fw of its argument f, being a scalar product between W and its argument. Okay, you can generalize that slightly by applying some nonlinear function outside of that scalar product that would correspond to the perceptron problem that many of you studied and us studied. And the multilayer or deep neural network is yet another parametrization of this function that is written <laughs> up there that is kind of hierarchically applying this perceptron. Ne not necessarily with the nonlinearity that is sign, but with these nonlinear functions that are phi 1 up to phi 4. And the drawing below is how people usually represent this parametrization of the function. So the details of this are not really important. You know, just to say, like, how is this classifying cats or dogs? So what is the machine actually doing and training? The freedom in this parametrization are these parameters w's. So we need to set them in a way that the function works and recognizes cats and dogs. And how is this, one, this done? Well, in a conference where we are talking about fancy classes of algorithms, such as message passing and algorithms that work in glassy landscapes, it's very embarrassing that the way these deep neural networks are trained is the simplest algorithm one could possibly imagine. So as long as you have a lot of examples, so a lot of pictures, and a lot of computer power, you just write a sum over all your examples of what's the error, or what's the fraction of errors you are currently making on the training set. And this function can be, for instance, least squares. And then you are simply running gradient descent on these parameters w. And that works. That's what people are doing. 
So what do we know about it? Just one like little slide. You know, I could spend one hour talking about what we know and what we don't know. We know that this parameterization that I wrote is powerful enough and that it can represent generic enough function. So somehow information theoretically, we know that. But unfortunately, we also know that algorithmically finding those Ws is a hard problem. Well, nevertheless, in practice, we are doing it. And there is a bunch of you know, pretty much everything about these systems we actually don't know. Like notably, can we characterize the set of functions for which optimizing this loss function with the gradient descent as we are doing it in practice leads to good results? Like we have no satisfying theory for that. We don't know how many of these pictures we need to get to get a good performance. And you know, some other questions related to overparameterization that I will not be uh, mentioning. So, so you know, to get back to, my, to, to the main topic of my talk, you know, one could one ask basically this question. Like even in the simplest, and there are some exceptions listed below, non-convex neural networks, we do not understand yet well the behavior of the gradient descent based algorithms and the generalization error that they achieve. Like we don't have even the simplest models where we, where, where, we, where we could put hand on that. So our goal was to get at least the first moment where, this, where we can give a satisfactory you know, solvable answer to this question. So here I specify what I mean by the gradient-based algorithms. So I will be dealing with two basic ones that are very familiar to physicists. One is simply the Langevin dynamics, and the other one is the gradient flow, which is just the Langevin dynamics at zero temperature, if you want. Gradient flow is how people call it in computer science. And the question that I'm asking is, where do they go in large time? OK. But so this, you know, and there is some H, some Hamiltonian there that I didn't specify yet. Because that, you know, the next slide would be about what is a suitable Hamiltonian, what is the model for which a question like that can be answered, and that is at the same time kind of meaningful that it's a good model for, for what uh, you know, machine learning in neural networks, with neural networks could be. So this is my shopping list for, for the ingredients of the model that I want. So first of all, I want high dimensional, non-convex you know, optimization problem, because that corresponds to the neural networks that people are solving. So I could, for instance, consider here like any neural network, for instance, the random perceptron. But this is no good because of the second point. I also want the notion of this generalization error. So, so to go back to this loss function that we are minimizing, that's just the mean to find a good function that then generalizes well on the new examples. The true notion of error that we care about is this generalization error. We don't know how to minimize that directly, so we kind of minimize that by writing a loss function that we minimize instead. So I want a model where I have these two distinct notions of what is good. One is some energy that I'm minimizing, that's what the algorithm is aiming to do. But at the same time, I have a different notion of goodness that corresponds to the generalization error. So for this reason, I would like to have rather something like teacher-student perceptron for those of you who know what that is. But this is not good either, because for the teacher-student perceptron, I just don't know how to solve the Langevin dynamics or the gradient descent in a, in a nice close form enough so that I can actually explicitly uh, understand what the dynamics is doing. So I want the model also to be solvable. So you know, listing these three things, I could, for instance, consider the same model that Valentina talked about in the previous walk, talk that sometimes is called the spike tensor model. But that one also is not good because I would also like to have a model that has a large, kind of, that has a hope to have a large class of universality. And the spike tensor model, from the point of view of, uh, of, um, from the point of view I'm looking at it, has a very, very large phase where it is algorithmically hard to treat it and that doesn't seem to be universal, that doesn't seem to be the case in, in practice. So this is the shopping list and the model that satisfies it, that we kind of cooked up and that, we, that I will be analyzing for the rest of the talk is this one. So we call it mixed spiked matrix tensor model but you will see, you know, the last line is just a mixed 2 plus P spherical spin glass model. So what is the model? So there is a teacher or an oracle that generates a signal X star. So 
x tau will be a vector on a sphere. And that's a kind of signal that's the ground true that I'm trying to find. And closeness to this x star, that will be the, the, my notion of how good am I. And then I take this x star and I make an outer product with itself and add Gaussian noise. Is this working even? It's probably not. Oops. But no, I don't. Okay. And I add a Gaussian random noise to the outer product of x with itself. And that defines a matrix y. And now this y is observed. This is given to the computer. And at the same time, with the same signal x star, I create in a similar way a tensor t. And that tensor t is also given to the computer. But the x star is hidden. The whole goal is to find back the x star. So the model is the following. The computer sees the y and t and doesn't see the x star and has to find something very close to the x star. And the corresponding Hamiltonian or loss function, or I will you know, show on the next slide how, how this comes, is actually the following one. So that's the, that's the function on which the gradient descent will be running. And when you look at the Hamiltonian, that's exactly, for those who know, the mixed 2 plus p spin spherical spin glass, where usually the y and t would be just random ga Gaussian numbers. And now they are not exactly random because they depend on this x star. So it's the, it's the mixed spherical p spin glass with a particular disorder. So this will change a little bit things. So now, how do we, you know, what are the kind of ways we know in computer science how to estimate back this x star if we know the matrix and tensor, y and t? So the optimal way is Bayes optimal inference which corresponds to running the Langevin algorithm at temperature one for the Hamiltonian on the previous slide. That's you know, a fact that is proven easily. And another estimator that is often used that will correspond to gradient descent in that same energy landscape is the maximum a posteriori inference. So I will be comparing the two. So first, you know, I will sh show you what, what is kind of the what do we know independently of the Langevin algorithm or the gradient flow algorithm about the best obtainable solution of this problem? And this is, uh, you know, this is summarized in a line of work in which Andrea was involved and Jean Barbier sitting in the audience involved and a number of other people. Where, you know, in three points we kind of know how to solve this type of problem corresponding uh, to low rank matrix or tensor decompositions. We even know in this base optimal setting that the corresponding replica formulas are actually rigorously correct, thanks to the Nishimori conditions, thanks to which the proofs simplify and we can actually work them through. And we also have very good understanding of the performance of the approximate message passing algorithms, these AMPs that Mark and Andrea already mentioned. And this slide is just summarizing what it is. All is actually included in the replica symmetric free energy, that free entropy that for the present model is written up there. And, the, you know, and then there are claims about how to obtain the optimal error and what is the error that the algorithm is achieving. But I guess that rather than reading that, I will just show the phase diagram. So this is summarizing. Uh, what is the best achievable performance in this model, and then we will be comparing what the gradient flow and the Langevin algorithm is doing. So here I plot the two variances of the noise that are added to the signal. So on the x-axis is the noise on the tensor, and on the y-axis is one over the noise on the matrix. So when both the noises are very big, that would be this corner down here, it's hard, and up there it's easy. And the static solution of this problem splits into in between a paramagnet and a ferromagnet. So in paramagnet, the noise is too big. All the information about what the x star was is completely lost, and we can do nothing. And in the ferromagnet, the static solution of this problem is well co correlated with the x star. So that would be the green and the orange region. But then what distinguishes the green and the orange is whether the approximate message passing algorithm is able to pick the correlation or not. And in the green region it is, 
and in the orange region it is not. So the red region is no algorithm whatsoever is able to solve the problem. In the green region, the approximate message passing is solving it. And in the orange region, the approximate message passing is not solving it. And now, you know, I want to go back to the gradient-based algorithms, so the Langevin and gradient flow. And in this model, since it is a variant of the mixed P-spin glass, we can apply the dynamical mean field theory as we know it from the works of Grisanti, Horner, Sommels, Kuliandolo, Kurchan, and others that have also corresponding rigorous proof of the, of the equations. It's really a variant on the equations where the only thing we need to change is to remember that the disorder is not quite random, that there is this X star on which the disorder depends. So that effectively adds one more equation to the dynamical equations that tracks the other parameter that is the correlation between the dynamical state and the vector X star that here we call the C overline. But otherwise these equations look exactly how they look in those, uh, in those papers from 93. So I have two sets of them here, one for the temperature one, the Langevin dynamics, and one for temperature zero, the gradient flow. So if you know them, you will recognize them. If you don't, then you know, one, one is to go in more detail to derive that. So with this, I can go to the behavior of the algorithm. And here I am plotting the magnetization or the correlation of, with the ground truth that is reached after a certain time. And in the inset is the behavior of the approximate message passing that behaves intuitively in the sense as the noise is getting lower, the magnetization is getting better. The correlation is getting better and is doing so faster. So that's in the intuitive sense what should be happening. With the Lanceva dynamics, what's going on is that as the noise is getting smaller, the magnetization is getting bigger, so this is good, this is the intuitive direction, but it takes longer. So noise smaller, it takes longer. This is not so intuitive. Nevertheless, this is what's happening. And actually, the time it takes to magnetize is diverging at a certain value of the noise. And if we numerically collect those values in the phase diagram that I explained before, we get the green line up there, meaning that the green region where the approximate message passing algorithm worked is actually cut it by a significant amount into a region where also the Langevin works, but a region that there I called Langevin hard where the Langevin algorithm is just stuck at zero magnetization and at any finite time doesn't move out from there. So it's doing way worse than the approximate message passing. So this is kind of a first result, like we were not really exactly expecting that. I was always thinking that it will just be as good as the approximate message passing, but it is not. So now we need to explain or understand what's going on. But before going to that, let me show you the line at which the gradient flow, so that's the version of the grad, uh, algorithm at zero temperature fails, that will be slightly above the one where the Langevin fails. That's by itself not surprising because the Langevin algorithm aims to sample the posterior measure, which is the optimal thing to do. Whereas going after the ground state is not optimal in terms of obtaining the best correlation with the signal. So it's not surprising that the gradient flow is doing slightly worse. Okay? But we will still want to understand what it does exactly. And somehow the, so, so the next slide shows you somehow the popular explanation of how is it possible that there is a region where the gradient flow works and a region where it doesn't. So that would simply be, you know, as we are increasing the signal or decreasing the noise, it could be that the landscape has minima, and the blue one would correspond to the one that has good correlation with the signal, and the, the, the brown one would correspond to those that have no correlation with the signal. And if it looks something like that, then we would expect that in all the cases, except the last one, the algorithm will be stuck somewhere up there and do not find the blue minimum. So now, with the catch formula that Valentina explained and also Tuka was mentioning this morning, 
we actually can exactly count and characterize those local minima in that landscape. And this is again, you know, it's very similar to, to, to Valentina papers and also to paper by Andrea where all is done rigorously for, the, for a very related model. <coughs> so again, the formulas are not so important, but what is plotted on the next figure is the line above which there are no more spurious local minima and below which there still are. So there is a line. But what's surprising here is that this line is not agreeing with the line where the gradient flow stops working. So in particular, in between them, there are spurious local minima, but the gradient flow is not stuck in them. So this kind of popular explanation is not the right explanation. So what's going on? So we look yet more closely at the dynamics of what's going on. And here I'm plotting the energy as a function of the time for four different points in that phase diagram. And you see that there are some cases where we saturate on a kind of plateau. And then there are some cases where we saturate on a plateau and eventually go down. And when we go down, that actually will correspond to the optimum well, magnetization. Here I'm just showing that this is from like solving the Kuliandolo-Kurchan equations and this is from simulations. And, and we see big finite size effects, so it's easy to miss this kind of behavior in the simulations, but we kind of see that it agrees. So once more the same picture, but now together with the energy, I plot on the other side in dash the magnetization. And you see that the magnetization, that is the correlation with the ground truth, what we are interested in and want to be big, starts to become positive exactly when the energy drops in the gray and the green case, and not in the, and in the red and yellow case, the magnetization stays zero. And the dashed line that is plotted there, that's actually something that in spin, spin glass theory we also know, that's nothing else but the threshold energy in the mixed P-spin model that didn't have the X star, that didn't have the ground true signal, that is just a pure mixed P-spin model. And you see that the plateaus of the dynamics agree very well with those threshold states. So, what th so the picture that we are getting here is that the dynamics first goes to the threshold states. And once it gets there, then the question is, does it get unstable or not towards the signal? And kind of collecting that from the dynamics, no, we have, we have actually three independent derivations, but kind of the one that is the simplest in the sense that it enters in one slide is the following. So we first need to write the equation, the first one, that is telling us where are the threshold states. So this is just the replicon condition for this model that tells us what's the overlap for the threshold states. And the second equation, that's equation that tells us how the approximate message passing algorithm evolves the magnetization given Q the overlap. And that actually happens to stay valid to even to describe the instability of the threshold states. So simply just putting these two together, we end up with the condition below that, you know, so, you know, as the equation doesn't look like anything, but if we actually plot it in my figures, for the gradient descent is the blue line going through the black points that were, com that were obtained from the numerics. So it agrees perfectly with, uh, with the numerics. That's, that's the right line. That's the right threshold below which the gradient flow is not working. It's not zero. No, no, no. It's different from zero, yes. It, whether it becomes different from zero continuously or discontinuously depends where you are, I think. Also on the temperature, yeah. And so the same picture for this was for the gradient descent, now for the Langevin dynamics, actually the green line, that's, that's the line that we obtained and the points are the points obtained from the numeric. So again, they agree you know, precisely. And so, you know, last slide is to correct this kind of popular uh, explanation. So the right popular explanation is the following one. 
it's again you know, the same figure with the same local minima as they were before, but I actually added the saddles. And the dynamics told us that we get stuck at the most upper saddles, at the most upper level of uh, when there are some critical fixed points. And then actually what matters is whether the most upper ones get unstable towards the signal or not rather than whether they are lower-lying spurious local minima or not. And that's what makes the gradient descent work even in this like middle region where we do have at low energy spurious local minima, but at the energy where the dynamics get stuck, we have an instability in the direction of the signal. So that's what makes the algorithm work even in the region where there are spurious local minima. And that's kind of non-intuitive from the like, computer science optimization point of view. So this is in a cartoon, you know, uh, the, the, the previous slide, but we also, as I said, we have three different derivations and one is based on the Gasserise formula and on the, on the properties of the corresponding Hessian in there that uh, Valentina was mentioning. And the other one is based on an expansion of the dynamical equations around zero magnetization at large times using the Guliandolo-Kurchan theory in a sense. So with this a conclusion, so what I showed you here is that, you know, in this model which, look, which is very familiar to this community because it's basically some version of the spherical mixed B-spin glass problem, the gradient flow algorithm is worse than the Langevin, this itself is expected, but both are worse than the approximate message passing in terms of finding the signal. And what can, the question that remains is that how can we tweak them, how can we change them so that they become as good as the approximate message passing. The second point is, you know, the gradient descent can work even when there are spurious local minima by the mechanism that I explained. And the third point is that this is, you know, I think the first time that we have a closed form, very simple form conjecture for a threshold at which the gradient uh, based algorithms, whether it is the Langevin or flow, stop working. And the question is whether the analysis that we have is applicable beyond the present model, because the present model is not a neural network. So we would like to do it in some model that is closer to the ones that are interesting in practice. So I'm hoping that Stefano is, is, is running some simulations that will answer the green questions as we are speaking. And kind of the you know, big conclusion is that, you know, that in this business of machine learning that came back in a, in a big way in the recent years. I mean, this community still has a lot of to contribute and it's our job as well to understand what's going on in these systems. And that's all, thank you. Yes, yes. If, uh, so here, no, right? The noise was just random matrix, yes. just a full rank random matrix. Yes. And the signal was a matrix, but the rank one matrix. But and I added the two together. And they made, and that made so the that's a very different structure. Yeah, that is, yeah, that is the, the rank one structure that is what makes the signal discoverable. Okay. But I'm not, you know, I, I think Jeff Winton might still be mad at this model. It's still like arguable, very simple, and not at all, you know, explaining why, <laughs> yeah, what's going on in cats and dogs. <laughs> we know, we know. Okay, no other question? Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, I kind of switched from a supervised setting, which is the cats and dogs, to a model that is really an unsupervised, uh, uh, unsupervised learning problem. 
and I kind of, you know, the, I kind of, the thing I really wanted to keep is this, you know, closeness to the ground truth that is, that cannot really even be called the generalization error. But what's important is that there are two different notions of error. There's the energy itself and the closeness to the ground truth. And that they are not the same and I can, you know, I'm interested in one, but I'm actually trying to optimize the other. So this is what's common in, you know, supervised neural networks and this model. This is what I wanted to keep. But, you know, otherwise, you know, this is unsupervised. The cats and dogs are supervised. That's where, you know, here I am going after some like latent variables, whereas in the supervised I go after the function. It's different. Yeah. That's also why, um, you know, the, the, the third point here, I would like to go to a model that is more of a supervised neural network model. That's exactly why. Okay, so Dr. Gaines,